Well, there's a couple of things I want to announce before we jump into this morning's word, and that is uh, in just a couple of weeks, we will be celebrating River of Life's five-year anniversary, the 27th of April. The 26th is our actual anniversary. That's a Friday night. But Saturday night, the 27th, we are going to uh, move our gathering. We're going to not do a Sunday morning gathering that weekend. We're going to try and get our whole church family to get together, and we're going to meet over at the gymnasium at the school where we started. And uh, we are just very excited about that weekend. And I want to encourage you if, you, if you haven't already, mark it down on your calendar to come and be a part of that gathering. Uh, we are going to celebrate together as a family. We've got a couple of special guests that are going to be with us that night. And we're just very excited about that. Also, that Sunday morning, we wanted to, as we were planning for this five year, we were thinking, what can we do to celebrate what God has done in East Missoula and so we began to brainstorm and talk about it a little bit. And so we made the decision that we were going to do our Saturday night gathering back where we started. We started this church on Saturday nights at Mount Jumbo School. That's where it all began. And so we decided that's when we would do our gathering. And then Sunday morning, if you come on Saturday night, we're going to talk a little bit about this, but we're going to hand out street team shirts to anybody who will make a commitment to come back on Sunday morning. And on Sunday morning at 10 a.m., we're going to meet in this place. We're going to have a uh, a few moments of prayer together, and then we're going to send out the biggest street teams event that you've ever seen, and we're hoping to send hundreds of people into this community to go and clean the streets and to bring us back to the roots. If you've been a part of River of Life for any amount of time, you know the very first ministry we ever did at this church was street teams, and so it's it's an important part of our of our uh, of of who we are and part of our DNA, and so we just thought this would be a great way for us to celebrate on that weekend. So I want to encourage you to be there. If you if you have something else on your calendar, please try and change it because this is going to be just a great time for us as a family to come together and to celebrate what God's doing. And can I tell you, God has brought us such a distance in those five years. It's amazing to see what God has done. And I was standing here yesterday and I told the crowd last night, I said, I could tell that God has really had his hand on River of Life because we're at a place right now where we have cup holders on our, on our mic stands. And I'm just saying, I mean, if, when you have arrived at this point in life where all of a sudden I looked yesterday and I went, there are cup holders on our mic stands. And that's when you have arrived, right? Uh, no, we all know God has done some amazing things out here in East Missoula. And not to make light of that, I just had to comment on it because I got to do what I can to bug Dan. Um, but make note of that. And if you can be a part of that, we would love to have you be there. After the gathering on that Saturday night, we're going to do a big barbecue and just kind of hang out together as a church family. We've invited other people from the community to come and celebrate with us. And so it's going to be a great weekend. And so make sure that you put that down. I also wanted to mention to you, people have asked what's going on with the, uh, the fires that took place this week out here in Milltown. And uh, it was amazing because the night, the, while the fires were going on and the firemen were on scene, I got a call from somebody involved and they said, hey, you might want to get your first responders ready because they're going to be needed. And so I placed a phone call and we began to make some preparation. As you know, two families basically have lost almost everything that they had. And this is what we started this ministry for just a few months ago. And so uh, Travis came out on Friday and was at the school in the room that we have set aside for furniture. And he began to look at what we have and, and began to communicate with the firemen and with uh, the Red Cross. And we're working together with them to do what we can to help. But I'm telling you that because I want you to know that probably over the next few days or at least the next few weeks, we're going to put out a call for some of the things that we still need. So if you'll just be mindful of that, pay attention to our Facebook posts or our Twitter feed if you can, and you'll see the things that are needed. And then how great is it for us to be able to reach into this tragedy and to, to be able to help in whatever way we can. And so I just want to thank all of you who are going to be involved in that. And if you would just make note of that. I also need to tell you that Tuesday night, the class on Luke and the prayer time is not going to happen this week. And we'll keep you posted as to when that's going to start up again. Well, we're in our Person of Interest series. We started this last week. If you've ever seen the show Person of Interest, for some of you, you never have seen it. And uh, you go, Jason, you just like the show that much that you name your series after it? Yeah, kind of. No. Uh, now I, if you've watched the show, what you're going to find is that it's a show about these guys that uh, one of the guys invented this computer. And he's able to... Uh, basically track people all over the world uh, through security cameras and all those things. And it basically will tell when there's going to be an issue, when something's going to go wrong with somebody. And then him and his team come in and they try to solve it before the problem actually even happens. 
And so it's an interesting concept. It is a show that I enjoy watching. And so, uh, but as I was looking at this, I realized that for us to start this on Easter, I want people to understand that Jesus isn't just some historical figure. Jesus isn't just some nice guy or some prophet. But Jesus, when he comes onto the scene, he changes outcomes. He changes the way things would go down if it wasn't for him being part of the scenario. And so last week, we looked at a guy named Nicodemus. And today, we're going to look at a story that probably all of us are fairly familiar with. Whether you've been in church or not, you probably have heard of Lazarus. And so that's what the story we're going to look at today. And, uh, and we're going to kind of join this story already in progress. We know that as you read this story, if we were to read the whole chapter, we would find that Mary and Martha had sent for Jesus. They were friends with Jesus. Jesus was a friend of Lazarus. And they sent and they said, listen, Jesus, Lazarus is really sick and you need to get here so that you can take care of him because we know who you are, Jesus. And we know that if you were to come and you were to speak life over him, that this sickness would be gone. And we wanna see him healed because we love our brother and we know you love him as well. And so they send for Jesus and Jesus he gets the message and then he doesn't do anything with it. He kind of stays where he is. And so we're going to pick up that story right about there. A little, a little uh, time after that, Jesus shows up on the scene. And we read in, chap- in uh, chapter 11, verse 17, it says this. When Jesus finally got there, he found Lazarus already four days dead. Bethany was near Jerusalem, only a couple of miles away. And many of the Jews were visiting Martha and Mary, sympathizing with them over their brother, Martha heard Jesus was coming and went out to meet him. Mary remained in the house. Martha said, Master, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask God, he will give you. Jesus said, your brother will be raised up. Martha replied, I know that he will be raised up in the resurrection at the end of time. You don't have to wait till the end. I am right now, resurrection and life. The only, and the one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, will live. And everyone who lives believing in me does not ultimately die at all. Do you believe this? Yes, master, all along I have believed that you are the Messiah, the son of God who comes into the world. After saying this, she went to her sister Mary and whispered in her ear, the teacher is here and is asking for you. The moment that she heard that, she jumped up and ran out to him. Jesus had not yet entered into the town, but was still in the place where Martha had had met him. When her sympathizing Jewish friends saw Mary run off, they followed her, thinking she was on her way to the tomb to weep there. Mary came to where Jesus was waiting and fell at his feet, saying, Master, if only you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her sobbing and the Jews were uh, sobbing, The Jews with her, sobbing, a deep anger welled up within him. He said, where did you put him? Master, come and see. They said, now Jesus wept. Now, as I reread that passage of scripture, I I was reminded of the fact that we read this and we think, well, maybe Jesus wept because he felt some sympathy and some sadness for what these people are going through. But honestly, I think Jesus was saddened here It wasn't by the death of Lazarus because he's got that under control. He was saddened because nobody seemed to have faith that Jesus could fix this situation. Here are people that knew him, that had walked with him, that had seen what he was able to do, and yet in this situation, they are all crying and upset, thinking that there is no hope. And I think that's why Jesus was so sad. The Jews said, look how deeply he loved him. Others among them said, well, if he loved him so much, why didn't he do something to keep him from dying? After all, he opened the eyes of the blind man. Then Jesus, the anger again welling up within him, arrived at the tomb. It was a simple cave in the hillside with a slab of stone laid against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. The sister of the dead man, Martha, said, Master, by this time there's a stench. He's been dead for four days. Jesus looked her in the eye. Didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Then the others, then to the others, go ahead, take away the stone. They removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes to the heaven and prayed, Father, I'm grateful that you have listened to me. I know you always do listen, but on account of this crowd standing here, I've spoken so that they might believe that you sent me. Then he shouted, Lazarus, come out. 
and he came out, a cadaver wrapped from head to toe and a kerchief over his face. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him loose. Let's pray. God, as we look at this passage of scripture that many of us are familiar with, I pray that this morning, Father, you'll show us something new, that God, we will understand how you change things. And Father God, I pray that not one of us will leave this place the same way we were when we came in. But God, I pray that we'll leave this place transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit. We give you all the praise this morning in Jesus' name, amen. So I want us to look at this story for a little bit because I think there's some things that we need to understand about uh, a traditional Jewish burial at the time for us to, to get the point that I wanna make this morning. As I did a little bit of research, I found that it's kind of interesting the, the, the procedure that would take place if you were gonna bury someone. The first thing that would happen is probably even before the person were to die, you would go and you would, you would find a place that you could own that you could dig into the side of a wall. It was limestone and, and it, was, it was something that you could dig into. It would take a lot of work, but it would be something that was possible. And so a lot of the tombs that you'd see in those days, it would be just a wall that somebody would have dug into. And a lot of times they would put two chambers inside of this cave, this man-made cave that they made. The first chamber being the entry chamber and then right beyond that would be a chamber with a slab of stone and that's where they would lay the body and then they would cover that with a rock and it was something that you dug in and it took a long process and a lot of times a whole family would share that same tomb the next thing that they would do is after somebody would pass away they would take the body and a lot of times it was the women and family members and friends that would wash the body and then they would begin to anoint that body with some some fragrant spices and ointments and oils and they would do this not as an embalming process, but as a sign of respect to that person that had passed away. They would also do it because it would cover the smell of the body. The next step after that was they would take fine linen and they would rip it into different size pieces and they would begin to wrap the body. And that was a procedure because you wouldn't leave a body in the clothes that they died in and you wouldn't want to leave them naked because that would be a sign of disrespect. So they would take this linen and they would wrap the body. The other reason that they did this, I found as I studied this a little bit, was they did this in order to hold the body together, to have it continue to look like a body. Maybe you know, and not to, I don't want to get too graphic here this morning, but after time, that would begin to decompose and to fall apart, and they wanted it to always have that, that look of a body, so they would wrap it tightly to hold it together. And then they would do what they call the last rites. And part of the reason I want you to understand this is I want you to understand that Jesus' timing is perfect. Jesus doesn't make mistakes. I mean, here we are, we got Mary and Martha, and they're thinking, Jesus, what's the deal? I know you got all these people that want to see you, but this is Lazarus, your friend. I thought we were friends. We asked for you to come and take care of this, and now he's four days, he's dead. Here's the thing about that, and I've never caught this before this, this last few weeks as I was studying this again. Four days is a huge thing because you understand that that in, in this time, what would happen is somebody would die and the women would go through this process of they would, they would anoint the body, they would, they would put all these fragrant things on there, they would wrap it, they would put it on this little bed type slash shelf inside the tomb, and they would leave the tomb open for three days. And I began to study this and I thought, the re and I found that the reason that they would do this, there's two reasons. The first one is family members who were coming from out of town needed to have time to get there to pay their respects. And so they needed to leave it open for that amount of time. The other reason is three days was apparently the magic number that if the guy happened to still be alive, he, we, you'd know it within those three days, apparently. I don't know how often that happened that they had to come up with that exact number, but that's the number they came up with. And so for three days, the tomb stayed open in case our friend here got up and decided that he wasn't dead after all. So four days is the day. On that fourth day, they seal the tomb. They say there is no more hope. He's gone, and they seal the tomb. I want you to hear that this morning because I want you to understand it's not a coincidence that Jesus waited four days to come and see Lazarus. You see, he wanted there to be no doubt in anybody's mind that it wasn't that Lazarus actually hadn't died, that Lazarus all of a sudden was feeling better and got up and, and just started walking again. He wanted it to be known that four days he's dead. Hope is gone. 
So that's why Jesus waited for four days. He wanted people to know. See, Jesus could have come earlier. He could have healed Lazarus of whatever it was that Lazarus had. But you know what? People in those days had already seen Jesus heal people. He wanted to take it to the next level with his friend Lazarus. So as we look at this story, I want to look at it in a little different light. I want us to understand something. You see, Mary and Martha, they called for Jesus, knowing that Jesus could heal him, and Jesus waited those four days. And Jesus' timing we know is perfect. He didn't come after one day or two days or three days. He waited the full four so that the tomb would be sealed. And as we look at this story, we see that Jesus shows this wide range of emotion, which often we don't see with Jesus. We don't often hear the the storyteller tell us about this emotion that, that Jesus may have been feeling at the time. But it's amazing how Jesus comes on the scene and there's part of him that's probably pretty excited because he knows what he's about to do. But then he's greeted with, with such uh, probably even a little bit of anger and maybe some, some snarkiness, a little bit of people being upset. Jesus, how could you be late? Why wouldn't you come? Why couldn't you take care of this? Even if you'd have come a little bit earlier, maybe there would have been hope. But the stone's in place, Jesus. What you don't understand is he is dead and gone and you could have fixed it. And there's got to be part of him that is wondering, who are these people? And have they not seen who I am? Do they not know what I am capable of? So as I looked at this story the last few weeks, I began to realize that there are dead people among us. Now, don't get all six cents on me. I'm not talking about a Bruce Willis movie. I'm talking about the fact that there are those in our lives who are spiritually dead. There are those in our lives who walk around as if they're alive, but they have no hope. They don't know what it's like to have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't know what it's like to truly be alive inside as they they call out to the one who created them. They don't know that. And yet so often we allow these people in our lives to just walk around without hope and, and we don't do anything about it in this fear that we're going to upset them or offend them if we begin to talk about the hope that lives inside of us. So as I was looking at this, I realized that there are people inside of your life right now who have dug in, like you would dig into the side of a wall and you would, you would put a tomb where you, would, where you would lay a body. They've dug in. Can I tell you the reason they would do that is there's a permanence to that. There's a sense of permanence. It wasn't something that was portable. You couldn't like bury somebody and then move it. If I'm going to move somewhere else, I'm going to take that with me. No, it's there. And many of you have people in your life who their, their, uh, their lack of faith and their lack of relationship with God, they've dug themselves in as if it's a permanent thing. And you have almost kind of started to respect that as saying, listen, that's where they want to be. And so I'm going to leave them alone where they are. And can I tell you this morning that our job as believers is to not, uh, not assume that there's a permanence to anybody's spiritual death, but we are to step and to bring life. The next thing that happens, I think a lot of times as believers, is we take on the role of what these women would do, and we begin to cover the death with these ointments and with, these, with, with just trying to cover the stench of death in somebody's life. For a lot of people, I think that this is where we, we try and change the way the person acts without anything changing inside of them. We see this a lot with religion. We see this a lot with religion. A lot of people like to, to have all the rules and the regulations because it makes them feel like they're good people. But can I tell you, if you put perfume on a corpse, it's still dead. And that's what a lot of religions do is they put perfume on a corpse. That's why we, we're not big fans of religion here because I think religion makes you think that if you follow all the rules, you're okay when that is not what the Bible talks about. The Bible talks about relationship with Jesus Christ. The next thing that happens, I think, is a lot of times people will wrap themselves just like the ladies would wrap them in linen tightly to keep that body looking as if it was something that was familiar to us. There are so many people that walk around and they're wrapped in the lies that they've told themselves or allowed other people to tell them for for their whole life. You see this all the time when you see people who are struggling with addictions or struggling with, with, uh, with problems that they have in their life and all the family members act as if there's nothing wrong and they, they begin to, to feed into this lie and act like there's life there when there isn't life. 
Can I tell you, it doesn't matter how tightly you wrap it in your lies. If it's dead, it's dead. The thing that I appreciate about this story is that all these people did what they knew to do. And what they knew to do was dig in. What they knew to do was to cover the smell. What they knew to do was to wrap him. But what Jesus does is he comes in and he goes, I don't care what ointment you put on. I don't care how you wrap them. I don't care how nice the tomb is in the side of the wall. None of that matters to me because when I speak, I bring things to life. And for many of us in this room, you've got to understand that you serve a God who is big enough to bring death to life. No matter how dead the person may be, Jesus can bring death to life. You see, the next step in this process is for, uh, nice, nice of you to join us today, Donnie. <laughs> But you look sharp. You're looking good, buddy. Ah. Everybody else in the room is like, I'm never going to come sit in the front row of this church. I wouldn't do that to anybody but Donnie. Ah. The other part of this story is the stone. You see, we watch this and we see what the procedure is. We know that they dig in and then we know that they, that they wash and cover the, the body, and then they, then they wrap the body, and then they put it in there, and for three days it sits, and then after that, the stone is put in place, and that's a sign of permanence. There is no more hope. The stone is there. That guy is gone. If you want to come and visit him, you stand outside, and you know he's in there, and that's it. It's done. And I look at this story, and I couldn't help but think this time as I reread it through, I couldn't help but think about, we see that Jesus talks to the sisters, and he says, hey, move that stone. And what do they say? They say, listen, <laughs> that's cool and all, but the time to come and see him is past. Three days are over. So Jesus, you're a little late to even do a little visitation, because it was open for three days. If you'd have been a little quicker on the draw, you could have come and seen Lazarus. But the fact is, you're late, and the stone is there, and the reason the stone is there is because even with all the ointment that we put, he still stinks. And so we're going to keep that thing sealed, because we don't want that coming out here. And I thought about that as I reread that story because then Jesus went from them, he turned from them and he looked to some onlooker and he said, hey, you, move the stone. What if in this story, those people had said, listen, the sisters, they don't really want the stone moved. They don't want that to happen. That's disrespectful to them. And so we're not gonna do it. I wonder if that were to happen, if Jesus would have just went, okay, then I guess we won't do this. I guess you won't see what I was about to do. I mean, we all know Jesus could have moved the stone himself, but I wonder how many times in our life we've got people in our lives that we've put the stone up and said there's no way this person will ever receive Christ, and we put the stone there, and even at times when you feel a little stirred to go and talk to them again, you go, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not gonna fall for that again because every time I've ever talked to them about hope and salvation, they've always shot me down. So that stone is staying there, that stench is in there, and I'm not letting it out. But what would happen if we began to be obedient when Jesus begins to speak to you, when the Holy Spirit begins to draw on you and say, you know what, we, you need to talk to this person again. Their heart wasn't ready before, but it's ready today because four days have gone past and the miracle's even bigger than it would have been if, if they would have accepted two years ago. But today they're ready. You see, we've gotta be willing to move the stone when Jesus tells us to because he is the one that brings death to life. He is the one that can do the impossible. He is the one that can make things happen even when you don't see a way for them to happen. And if you don't believe that today, then I feel sorry for you because that's the Jesus that I serve. That's the Jesus that I read about in my Bible. And it's the same Jesus that I serve this morning. See, a lot of times we think of these amazing stories and, and I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine if we had a funeral in this church and all of a sudden, we go through the whole process, everybody gets up and they share their stories about this person and how great they were and how much they'll be missed and how much we love them. Can you imagine if somebody walked in and went, what are you doing? Get up, 
and the guy gets up and walks, we would just be blown away. But can I tell you, that's the same Jesus that we serve today. And yet we limit him so much. We limit him to the, to the fact that we go, you know what? I've tried to invite them. Jason keeps telling me to invite people to church. Jason keeps telling me to witness and to share my faith and to tell my story to people. But every time I've ever talked to them, it just doesn't seem like they, they're interested at all. So I'm going to just go ahead and put this rock up here, and I'm going I'm to close the tomb because I don't see them ever coming to Jesus Christ. I've shared with you this story before, but my cousin when he was in his 20s, was a drug dealer. He did drugs. He dealt drugs. Out of my whole dad's side of the family, he was the only cousin that was not a follower of Jesus Christ. And my family prayed for him, and we prayed for him, and we watched him get worse, and we watched him get worse. We saw him go downhill and make bad decisions. We thought for sure this, this sucker's going to end up in prison. It's just, it's, the, it's his fate. And I think many people in the family put the rock up, said, ah, Randy's done. It's over. But you know who didn't put the stone up? My grandma. And my grandma prayed for Randy every day. She, she got on her knees and she prayed for Randy. And I bet it was not just one of these simple little, I'm washing the dishes, God help Randy. I think my grandma cried out in German on her knees as she prayed for my cousin Randy. And can I tell you, I was just in Canada for that funeral just a few weeks ago, and my cousin Randy has been on staff at a church for a long time, and he has, uh, he's now a chaplain in, in the uh, a series of elderly homes, so he goes and preaches the gospel throughout the week to all these elderly people, and I think that's a perfect perfect full circle because it was an elderly woman who got on her knees and began to cry out on his behalf, and now there he is, and he's reaching them week in and week out, and I just got to tell you that you may think, put the stone up, they're done, but then you don't serve the Jesus I serve because he is the one that breathes death to life. Some of you in this room, even this morning, you sit and you've got family members, maybe you've got children who are not serving God. And it's so hard to sit and to think about the fact that you've tried time and time again and you don't seem to be seeing any fruit or any response from anything that you've done. And sometimes it's so frustrating and you feel so discouraged after every conversation. You feel like you need to just give up. And I wanna tell you that maybe it's not the fourth day yet and Jesus isn't ready to show up in their life, but don't give up because he can and he will. And some of you need to hear that this morning. Because here's the thing. As much as we love our friends and our family members, he loves them more. He loves them more than you do. And some of you, that's hard to even wrap your brain around, but it's absolute truth. And he wants good things for them. So don't give up. Don't fall prey to this mentality that there's only there's, only, there's no way this can happen unless it happens in your timing because your timing is not his timing. Look at that. Mary and Martha, they would have had things end a lot differently, wouldn't they have? They'd have had Jesus come earlier on. They would have said, hey, Jesus, why did Lazarus even get sick? Why don't you just... Why don't you just take care of him now? He's starting to show a few signs that maybe something's wrong with him. Heal him now, and then we don't even have to worry about any of this stuff. But Jesus wanted to, uh, we're doing a light show right now. It's perfect timing. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, let me just say this. I love the guys at the tech booth because here's the thing. They work their tails off back there, and the only time anybody turns around and looks at them is if something goes wrong. <laughs> that is like the worst job ever back there. Because when you do it all perfect, nobody looks at you. But when something goes wrong, everybody's got to turn and look, don't they? That's, that's nice. We love you guys. You're awesome. Uh, but as I was looking at this story, I wanted you to hear this this morning. Because for some of you, I believe with all my heart that you've already begun the preparation for those in your life who are not living for Christ. You've begun to, to cover them with, with uh, a ways that you can be around them and pretend that everything's okay even though it's not. You've begun to fall prey to, to giving into their lies and, and wrapping them so that they still have some semblance as if they look like they're alive. But how many of you know you're either dead or you're alive? There is no in-between. And when Jesus steps into the scene, he says, listen, you guys don't get it, but my timing is perfect. 
You see, he says, I don't care that they're dug in. I don't care that they've been prepared with oil and spices because that only covers the smell of death. I heal it. I don't care that they've been wrapped in fine linen strips because we're about to introduce the world to its first mummy in history. The smell of death doesn't bother me because I have the authority over it and I can speak death to life. See, that's who Jesus is. That's who he wants to be in your life this morning. Maybe you're sitting in this room today and you'd say, Jason, you know, you're talking about this and you're talking about people in my life who don't know Christ, but maybe you're here today and you don't really have a relationship with Jesus. It was so cool last night. I got done preaching this message and I had a young man come up to me and he said, Jason, I raised my hand tonight, but he goes, I didn't fully understand what you were saying because on Sunday, Easter Sunday, I had a friend of mine and he already led me to the Lord. They shared with me about Jesus and about this hope that I could have if I would trust in him and if I would believe in him. And he said, he said, I didn't do anything with it right there, but as I was driving home from his house, I cried out to Jesus. And I said, I want you in my life and I want things to be different. So I said, well, tell me, how was your week? He said, I've experienced emotions I've never experienced before. He said, as I listened to you talk and you talked about death and life, he said, I knew what you were saying because I feel alive for the first time in my life. I want you to hear that this morning because some of you have been wrapped in the lies of this world for so long that you feel like, well, I, I, I'm just like everybody else. I look the same, so everything's got to be okay. And I want to tell you, that is a lie from the enemy. He has life for you today. But if you continue to just walk it out as if everything's fine, even though inside there's a hollowness and emptiness that needs to be filled, it can only be filled through a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, this isn't about religion. Religion tells you follow the rules and everything will be okay. That's wrapping it in linen, and it's still a corpse. The reality is, is you've got to allow Jesus to step into the scene and tell you, come on out. There's life for you. Doesn't matter who put the stone there because it can be removed. And Jesus can speak death to life. Would you close your eyes with me for a moment? If you're in this room this morning and you'd say, Jason, I hear what you're saying. And as, as you've said those words and, and you talked about even that young man that approached you last night, I feel like there's part of me that I've been putting on a show. I've been putting on a facade as if things are okay. But inside, I know something's missing. And today, I want to I wanna roll that stone away. I want to I wanna experience your life that can only come through relationship with you. No one else in this room is looking around. But I want the opportunity to pray with you before you leave this room today. I'm not going to have you stand up. I'm not going to have you come forward. I just want to pray with you. And this is your moment. This is that moment in your life where the stone is being moved and Jesus is calling your name, will you get up and answer him? It'll change everything. So this morning, if you're here and you'd say, Jason, I just want to make sure that my relationship is right with God. Would you do me a favor and lift up your hand and catch my eye? I just want to pray with you before you leave today. Is there anybody like that at all? Would you say, Jason, would you pray with me before I leave? just want to make sure that my relationship with God is where it should be. Is there anybody like that at all? Take one more second. I'm going to assume that everybody in the house this morning is in a place where they are having conversation with Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here and you're still not sure about all this stuff. I'd love the opportunity to talk with you afterwards. But for everyone else in the room, I want to challenge you today. I know that even as I spoke those words, some of you immediately thought of somebody in your life that you've almost given up on, that you've come to a place where you thought that'll be the day. Yeah, sure. Sure. I'm sure they'll come and they'll accept Christ. I'm sure that'll happen sometime soon. And you're like Mary and Martha who said, man, if only, if only. That's putting your faith in what you can do. 
But this morning, I want you to put your faith in what God can do. Because it doesn't matter if it would have been one day, two days, three days, four days. It could have been three weeks. If Jesus wants him alive, he's alive. So for some of you, you feel like it's been months. It's been years. And you don't see how it's possible, and that's okay. Because God's plan isn't determined by what you can do. It's determined by what he can do. So as we close with this last song, I want to challenge everybody in the room. Maybe you've got people in your life right now that come to your mind. In these last few moments, will you take some time and begin to pray? And as you pray, I want you to envision yourself rolling that stone away, preparing the way for that family member or that friend. Because I believe with all my heart, if we'll do this, we will see people come to know Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, right now, we thank you that you bring death to life, that you are the God who controls everything. And Father God, I know that there are family and friends represented in this room today who God seems so lost and so far from you. It seems so impossible, but I thank you, God, that you are a God of the impossible. You are a God that can do what no one else can do. So, Father God, I pray that we will begin to allow faith to well up in us. And that, God, even in these next few moments, as we think of these friends and family members, that, God, we will have a mental image of rolling that stone away in preparation for the miracle that you're about to do in their lives. We give you all the praise this morning, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.